um, is an interest in coaching Essendon, I would be derelict in my duty as a director and a president to not go and talk to him. Oh, it's been disappointing. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, probably think I'd deserve better. Tough on Ben, yep, for sure. But that's the sort of thing I think we have to do and what I have to do for this club to improve and get better and go forward. At least they're consistent. Because they consistently don't know what they're doing and they consistently get it wrong. They are a dysfunctional place. The fact of the matter is, they should back in their people from my point of view. He's a wonderful coach, wonderful man, and a very good servant that should, for me, be leading that club forward. Now an opportunity for Ioli. He'll step, he'll snap, and he'll go. His best kick. Edwards is going to scoop it up and kick the easiest of goals. Swippy Hamble to Ross was good. Decides to have a shot on his own and he gets it. It's been a really draining week, mate. It really has. Um, you know, just things you don't expect to rock up and have to deal with on a day to day and it's taken its toll on him and the, the rest of the playing group. I'm committed to coaching this footy club. That's my job, that's what I signed up for. I didn't uh, put my hand up to coach this footy club because I thought it would be easy. I did it because I thought I could make a difference. So it's the last day of the home and away season for the AFL 2022. Plenty of eyes on the field later, but right now... All eyes are on the board meeting that are happening at that's happening at Essendon as we speak. Our panellists this morning, Alistair Nicholson, Chloe Salto and Waleed Ali. Good morning to Alistair. There's 10 board directors currently sitting around. They're going to have a vote on Ben Rutten's future. Will he survive? I thought it was impossible that he would survive. And then I got a bit swept up in what was taking place last night and the overwhelming support from all quarters for Ben Rutten. And I started to think about what do you do next if you're Essendon? So Alistair Clarkson, they made the play for him, albeit way too late for him to take that seriously. But where do you go to? It looks like Adam Uze or Adam Kingsley are going to be appointed as the coach of GWS. So who is the option if you don't go with Ben Rutten, who you are? contracted to have as your coach for next season. So they're in a difficult position. They would almost have to go down the path of, of appointing a coach is almost very similar to the one that they've, they've currently got, Chloe. Well, what they have to do next at Essendon is actually do a proper external review. The one that the new president, uh, we understand, wanted to do at the, at, the, um, at the midpoint of the season when it was clear that things were going wrong. They, they have to do that proper process and then and then take it from there, which makes me think that, I mean, the, the last week has been shambolic and embarrassing and all of those words, but surely that has to be the focus now at this board meeting today. Um, you know, and in terms of who the candidates are, um, it's, it's been reported that there's a, a push from some elements of the club for, for James Hurd and, you know, that there'll be a lot of emotion around that and I'm sure there are some in the Essendon faithful who might want that to happen but if you run a proper process and a proper search process um, you know he hasn't sort of uh, until probably the last few months done it gone and done a um, proper as assistant coaching role at another club the way that say a Michael Voss of that it's did. been a landmark um, we know weekend the other for Australian are. rules football um, for the first time one ever of them will be announced as all GWS 18 clubs coach this week so it's a good question. Where to from here? The one who doesn't get the GWS job is probably a really good candidate. But the point that you make, Chloe, about the external review is absolutely right. You, I don't see how they can emerge from a board meeting today with anything other than a status quo that says, pending the review, we'll make a decision. That doesn't mean they won't do mm. something else. I mean, who knows what will come out of it. But that's the only logical thing to do. Otherwise, what's the point of... What are you reviewing? If, you, if you're going to come out and say, well, we're getting rid of Rutten... That's, now you're beginning the search for a coach, which is not a review, that's a slightly different thing. So it would make no sense, I, I think, for anything else to happen. The James Hurd thing is extraordinary, I think, that they would even be considering that. And, I, I, and I, you know, I'm, this isn't me trying to pile into James Hurd. It's, it just comes down to the football question of on what basis would you appoint him? The, the way to think of it is this. Would any other club in the AFL who needed to appoint a coach think of appointing James Hurd? Well, Right now, the answer is no. In five years, ten years, maybe. But right now, the answer is no. So what business would Essendon have mm. doing that? And so that, that's where sporting clubs are different to an aver average business. They're run as a business, mm. but there's just so much emotion swept up in this. And I think um, what didn't help was that it was incorrectly reported on Monday on Radio 3AW that Rutten had been sacked. Mm. But he had never been sacked, and I don't think there was ever any intention for him to be sacked. It was just the fact that... Dave Barham comes in after a coup, so clearly the board is split 
and his first move is to ring Alistair Second. Clarkson. Yeah, so, before he tells Rutten. Before, correct, and that's probably what the, the error mm. is that he told him after, yeah. and you can understand why Rutten feels upset about it. But it's a writing on the wall situation for Rutten, right? The, the, the issue wasn't, yes, you're right, the reporting was wrong that he was yeah. sacked, but it's also that his situation became immediately untenable. It's a very difficult thing, I think, to coach a team when you know the club is seeking out someone else specifically. Um, and that's why I think in the long run it's very hard to see him hanging on, especially when there are other candidates out there. Um, and I think I would disagree slightly with you, Alistair, that I, I don't think whoever they appoint is the same kind of person as Rutten. Rutten's been in the job really for three years because that last year under Worsfold he was in charge. Yeah. Of it. Um, just imagine the scenario where Rutten stays on and they're one and four after round five next year. What do they do then? Um, I just, it's just a situation that I think is incredibly difficult for them to try to negotiate that way. I think you need a reset after something yeah. like this and there are candidates out there. He's got the playing group, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I think you're right, Chloe, I mean, David Barham speaks about a significant cultural change. There's every chance, and they're going to be the story of the summer now, given what's happened. They, they can't really make amends until round one next year, where there's every chance they'll have a new CEO, a new coach and a new captain. And that's right. And I, listening to Joe Watson on um, the Channel 7 broadcast last night, um, just saying, you know, it, it's time to, to look ahead and move forward. And perhaps, Kel, that, that's the way to do it with new people in all those positions. It appears from, you know, um, reading Caroline Wilson this weekend that the, the football department is also deeply divided. So I, I guess I come back to my first point that, that this this external review has to be done independently and and properly um, and that they need to sort of look ahead. And look at, um, you know, my, Michael Hurley finished up last night. Um, he's been so loyal to that club in a way, like he lost the probably, he was at the peak of his career during the, when he, he was suspended with those players for six months. Um, and to hear him talk uh, during the week about, you know, the instability at different times of his career, it's kind of, sad it's a bit of an indictment on the club that for that long those have been cultural problems and they need to as Dave Barham says they need to build a new culture from yeah. now and, and internal reviews I think have just proved that they're I mean they're rubbish aren't they they're just mates saying good job good job good job tick 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 we're all on the right path who would you rather be Essendon where they asked the question of Alistair Clarkson who was clearly interested because he met with them this week or St Kilda that reappoints Brett Ratton without asking the question of Alistair Clarkson, who lives around the corner and wanted to stay in Melbourne, has only won one premiership. Alistair Clarkson's a legacy coach. He wants to, he wants to be there for the story. Um, and, and now they're announcing basically an internal review with David Noble coming in after they've just re-signed the coach for two years. Yeah, it goes to show how quickly things can change. If you look at the halfway mark of the season, St Kilda looked like it was a chance, albeit I think with a, a list that probably wasn't capable of maybe challenging for the top four and, and they're going to miss the finals, the Saints, so it's really disappointing. But we've also seen examples over recent years of, of staying the course and getting behind coaches who look like, even going right back to Bomber Thompson, there was a review at Geelong before he took them to premiership success. It happened at Richmond with Damien Hardwick. So. <laughs> Every time that happens, you can look at a St Kilda and say, yeah, but it doesn't work because look at all the... I mean, that's sort of picking stats out. And, it's and always referred back to that, isn't and it? And each story is different. Yes. Like the Hardwick one's interesting because people often cite it and they focus on 2016, but they don't focus on 2013, 14, 15, where yeah. he got them into the finals after they'd been out of the finals for more than a decade and they had this young list. So, you, you know, but then Nathan Buckley is probably the better example where, where there seemed to be no real reason to stick with Buckley because he's record over years had been trending declining down. and then suddenly um, he revived them. That, that's probably the stronger example. But, but I think what it shows is, and you need this, you need to be unified. You need at every level of your club to be unified. It's clear at Essendon and what we've seen in the last week that they're not unified, that there's turmoil in the ranks and, and that has undermined the coach. So you want stability at your football club and I think that can lead to success. If you have instability, as we're seeing at the West Tigers in the NRL mm. at the moment, then performance drops away to such an extent that you become basically an on-field embarrassment. And it's a difficult thing to get 
particularly in the big clubs. Yep, of, mm. power clubs. Yeah, yeah. coterie the, groups, all of these ones that all want to have their say, and there's so plenty political. of money. And yeah. um, what if they got him? I mean, what if Alistair Clarkson had said yes? It's a very fine line between <laughs> being a fool and being Sonia Hood, who's been <laughs> hailed as an absolute hero, the uh, the president or chair of the Kangaroos, because across town at Arden Street, well, they rolled out the red carpet, didn't the Kangaroos for Alistair Clarkson this week? It was such a significant um, announcement. He started his football career at North Melbourne and he'll probably bookend it, Chloe, um, and finish up his coaching AFL career here. Yeah, and I, I think if you look at the way Sonia Hood ran this process and she really did get out the front of it and, and ran it, that she was very much sort of the president's process. Um, she was composed. Um, I think it was interesting in contrast with Essendon how she got all the uh, the um, the North boys, you know, the old guard, the champions in in her corner, you had Wayne Carey saying that, you know, um, Cl Alistair Clarkson's the man, he will bring instant respect and mm. instant credibility. Um, it really, I, I thought, you know, she comes out of that really, really well. Mm. And they ran the process over months. Mm. Um, they did exactly what Essendon should have done, which is made the call on their present coach, or former coach now, at the time. So what was it, July? Mm. Um, and then begin the process straight away. Essendon ends up in this situation because the board's split over whether or not they really want to get rid of the coach. Yeah, and, so they have and to make whether they want to approach Alistair Clarkson. Yeah, and I think too much criticism of Essendon in the past week has been that they mishandled the past week. No. Actually, they did kind of what they had to do. Correct. What they stuffed up was, was earlier. And that's exactly what North got right. And I yep. feel so good for them because of everyone they've missed. I mean, you remember the chase for, for Justin Martin. You remember the, the chase for Kelly. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it just felt like no one was going there, no matter what they put in front of people. Might and be a des the biggest of well, them all. might be destination club Maybe. suddenly. Yeah. Hey, let's have a look at the AFL ladder heading into the final three games of the home and away season. So, what I can tell you is that Geelong and Melbourne have secured the double chance. Brisbane will host an elimination final. The Tigers will lead a roaring. They're going to finish seventh <laughs> and they'll play either the Lions or the Pies in an elimination final. If Sydney and Collingwood win today, then they secure a spot in the top four, which of course means the double chance. And the Bulldogs can pinch eighth spot if they win and the Blues lose. But let's be honest, Al, it's, it's, it's all about Carlton and Collingwood in front of more than 80,000 fans at the MCG today. The Blues looking to make the finals for the first time since 2013, they've been inside the eight all year, and to get there, they have to beat their archest, archest of enemies. I think you almost need to be declared an honorary professor for even being able to explain all <laughs> of that because the word permutations comes out at this yes, time of year always, and we have had so many in the final round of this AFL season. But Carlton and Collingwood haven't played in a final since 1988 and this feels as big as that given what's at stake. Collingwood to go into the top four if they win and Carlton to play finals for the first time since 2013 if, if they win. So it's huge. The tickets have been sold out for the bulk of the week. It's going to be a massive game at the MCG and even going right down to the last game of the home and away season with Sydney and St Kilda as well. There's so much riding on that. So yeah, there's this suggestion that maybe we need all the games on at the same time. I can live with the status quo, provided the Western Bulldogs do the right thing early in the day and, and get that win. No, that's the exactly line. why the games have to be on at the same time. Uh, we've, we've, we've got to have it. It's this change mentality. It's no, been no, this no. way forever. No, it's no, no. It's going to go right no, down to the no. final siren because if the Swans beat St Kilda by nine goals, they finish second. Yes, but imagine... So they'd host Melbourne. Hey, but imagine if all that was happening at once. But what, where are you meant to watch? All what of it. What are you meant to watch? It, honestly, you, they do... How this. many sets of eyes have you got? Oh, you, how many screens have you got? You get any screens? <laughs> Honestly, like they, this is this is the Premier League model, and it's one of the great days on the sporting calendar. Why do we have to be like American? And you don't. ATV can I can I just remind sport? everybody that this is the way footy actually used to be? Well, was that everyone game was on a yeah. Saturday? Yes, yeah. and and it's fantastic. Like if Hawthorne beat the Bulldogs today, which is entirely possible, by the way, I don't mm. think it's likely, but it's mm. entirely possible. All this is over. No, well, you've still got Collingwood needs to win to make the top four, so yep. Carlton and, Collingwood and still Sydney matters. As well. And that is massive to make the top four and get the double Imag chance. Imagine, how, imagine when you're at a game and the result here is decided and your focus is entirely elsewhere and there's roars going around the stadium because of something that's happening some, like on the other side of the Stick country. To your well, Andrew, after Liverpool. three hours of instant yes. gratification, I want the whole day yeah. devoted <laughs> to this. No, undermine hey, um, On field play behaviour has been in the spotlight this weekend after two unsavoury incidents by two captains 
as well. One in the AFL, one in the NRL. First Alliance skipper Dane Zorko was forced to apologise after a sledge that left opposition player Harrison Petty in tears on Friday night. We believe it was about a family member. Zorko's apologised. The Lions apologised, Chloe. The AFL investigated and has now put it to bed. It's not a very good look for a captain, though, is it? Have they, has it? Should it be finished or should there be some sort of public apology, do you think? I think a, I, I think a, a, a quick public apology uh, was probably in order here. Um, you know, I, I suspect that Harrison Petty probably wouldn't want this investigation to drag on either, though. So, um, look, I, we, we don't know exactly what was said. So